Have you any last words, Don Brown? I am only walking as God foreordained I should walk. But I cannot remember a night so dark as to have hindered the coming day, or a storm so furious as to prevent the return of warm sunshine and the country at peace. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land can never be purged away but with blood. May 9, 1800, John Brown was born in Torrington, Connecticut. His parents, Owen and Ruth Brown, were deeply religious and passionately anti-slavery. The Brown family moved to Ohio when John was five. His mother died when he was eight. John was raised by his father as a Calvinist and to believe that slavery was a sin against God. Slavery, in the early 1800s, was an important part of the American economy, and most Americans were not concerned with the rights of the enslaved. Brown had certainly um, told many people over his lifetime that at the age of 12 he became a committed abolitionist when he witnessed the beating of a young black man his own age who had been enslaved and um, never hesitated to share that story with others throughout his lifetime. When he was 37, he stood up in a church full of people and raised his right hand and said, Here before God and these witnesses, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. For a short time, Brown lived in Springfield, Massachusetts. During this time, he met and became friends with a former slave named Frederick Douglass. In 1848, Brown moved to North Elba in upstate New York. He lived and worked in a racially integrated society. He took a stand on racial integration, on slavery. Uh, there were a lot of highly motivated, uh, well-intended people uh, in those days who, who uh, opposed slavery. William Lloyd Garrison, Abraham Lincoln, Wendell Phillips, Lydia Maria Child. One could go on and on of the people who disliked slavery and who took their own kind of stand. John Brown, however, was different because um, he was one of the only whites of that period who was completely untouched by the prevalent racism of his day, and he took a stand on the issue of race. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 placed the decision of slavery with the people of the settling territories. Settlers on both sides converged in Kansas with the hopes of influencing the decision on slavery. This included five of John Brown's sons. Brown wrote to them to find out what they needed. They responded, guns. John Brown went to Kansas to help his sons. Brown selected and killed five men who had threatened him and other free staters. These uh, murders by Brown and his men were retaliatory acts uh, that came after the sack of Lawrence, the free state capital, and also as a result of the beating of uh, Senator Charles Sumner, almost killed on the floor of the U.S. Senate. It wasn't just that John Brown thought it might be a good idea to, to use violence. He had, he had reasoned that after the Dred Scott case, which took citizenship away from black folks and also um, said that a black man has no rights, that a white man needs respect, he realized there was no legislative cure, there was no judicial cure, so there was no legal way to end or even limit slavery because all the compromises that had been made between this is going to be a free state and this is going to be a slave state meant nothing. If you could take a, a slave into a free state, he'd still be a slave. What does it mean to have a free state? It means nothing. In 1856, Brown defended Osawatomie, Kansas against the pro-slavers. To some, he had become a hero. To others, he was an outlaw. In 1857, John Brown was introduced to a group of New England abolitionists. They eventually became known as the Secret Six. They would aid him in his future plans. John Brown helped free some slaves in Missouri in 1858. He took them to safety in Canada, where in May of that year, he wrote a provisional constitution the purpose of the Constitution was to provide equal rights to all humans until slavery was abolished. 
Brown met multiple times with Frederick Douglass to discuss his developing plans to raid the federal arsenal at Harpers Ferry, Virginia. Brown begged Douglass to come with him. He thought he would be essential to help organize and attract enslaved people who might join them. He said, Douglas, when the bees begin to swarm, I want you to help me hive them. And again, Douglas refused to come. John Brown rented a farm in nearby Maryland where he secretly gathered arms and 21 supporters for his raid. On October 16, 1859, Brown attacked the armory at Harper's Ferry. He had planned to seize the arsenal and retreat to the mountains with his army of men. He was certain that local slaves would rise up and join him. His plan was to shepherd the weaker of the slaves to freedom in the north and to enlist the stronger, willing slaves in guerrilla warfare against the slaveholding communities, where more would be freed to escape or fight. The details of what happened during the raid and why John Brown failed to succeed in his mission are the subject of never-ending debate. Some say that he did not receive the support that he expected. Others say that more than 50 local slaves did come to his aid and that there was a successful cover-up of their involvement. What is certain is that John Brown easily overtook the arsenal, but he hesitated when he could have escaped. He treated his prisoners with great care, but there was innocent blood shed during the raid, most notably a freed black man named Hayward Shepard. The local militia rose to defend the armory, and when word reached Washington, President Buchanan sent Robert E. Lee and the Marines to put an end to the raid. During the event, 17 people were killed, including two of Brown's own sons. John Brown was wounded and captured. John Brown was taken to nearby Charlestown to be tried for treason against the state of Virginia and inciting a slave revolt. It was a speedy trial and massive military support was sent to prevent any attempt to free Brown or any other insurrection. On November 2nd, John Brown was found guilty and sentenced to hang, but during this time, his eloquence became known. His words stand as powerful statements against slavery. John Brown became a symbol for those who wanted to end slavery. The intellectual abolitionists, such as Emerson and Thoreau, took up his cause and used their influence to create a mythic figure for abolition. Both sides made an effort at this point to control public opinion. The South saw Brown as a symbol for everything they feared and hated about the North, and what they saw as an effort to end their way of life. John Brown was called a crazy, fanatic failure. John Brown had touched a raw nerve in the South. The facts of John Brown's history are corrupted by bias. There is an almost endless amount of research on the subject of John Brown. From the beginning, the way one viewed his story was dependent on how one viewed the issue of slavery. One can argue, as John Locke, the English philosopher, did, that slavery, by definition, is a state of war. Therefore, putting the actions of the enslaved and their supporters under the rules of war. This puts the actions of John Brown under a very different light than if you view him as a fanatic that broke the laws to achieve his goal. No matter how you view John Brown's actions, he clearly took a stand against slavery, not only during the raid on Harper's Ferry and in Kansas, but in the way he led his life. He was born for this. I'm not crying for him, Jeb. I see something else up there. Something much more terrible than just one man. On December 2nd, 1859, John Brown was hanged. I like the last verse of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which the tune is, you know, the same tune they use for John Brown's body. And of course, they're not talking about Brown, but in a sense, they are. Let us die to make men holy. Let us die to make men free. His true. I believe John Brown died to make men free, and I think that's his legacy. This